combustible tobacco continues to kill one person every five seconds. By the end of this year, smoking will kill more than 8 million people. That's 21,918 smoking-related deaths every single day, repeated daily for a whole year. Why is it when one person dies, it's a tragedy, but when millions die, it's just a statistic? Well, I refuse to accept any death as just a statistic. To me, every preventable death is a tragedy, especially when over 70% of smokers want to stop smoking. Nicotine vaping is smoking cessation and tobacco harm reduction epitomized. With nicotine vaping, you get all the pleasures of smoking while minimizing or eliminating harm. It can be that simple. But like anything else, vaping can be misused or abused. And when this happens, bad actors pounce on the opportunity. The same way that politicians pounce on raging desires and rampant prejudices. We've seen this playbook our entire lives. It's exactly like the war on drugs. Rather than using rational arguments based on all the facts, the public feeds on tragedy-induced rage, stigmatism, and vengeance. And this behavior needs to end because tobacco harm reduction and harm reduction in general works. Flavored ends save lives. Needle exchange saves lives. Safe supply works and brings people who use drugs in contact with addiction specialists. Crack pipe smoking kits save lives because it prevents spreading diseases and their resulting deaths. It's beyond time to end the hypocrisy because the drug wars only cause more harm than if you would have done nothing at all. It's that simple. Every five minutes, a person dies in the U.S. from an overdose. And every minute, a person in the U.S. dies from smoking. Every five seconds, someone on this planet dies from smoking. All because they don't vape to reduce tobacco harm. It's time to end the hypocrisy and embrace harm reduction. Eight million people a year are dying without it. Ain't nothing to it. I'm about to get into it. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending February 19th, 2022. Hey there, folks. In this episode, we're going to take a deep dive into harm reduction. But before we do, I need to report Element Vape website has been hacked, and your credit card and personal information privacy may have been compromised. Published at Bleeping Computer, we find. Warning, popular e-cigarette store hacked to steal credit cards. Bleeping Computer has confirmed Element Vape, a prominent online seller of e-cigarettes and vaping kits, is serving a credit card skimmer on its live website, likely after getting hacked. With its presence across the US and Canada, Element Vape sells e-cigarettes, vaping kits, e-liquids, and CBD products in both retail outlets and in their online store. Element Vape's website is loading a malicious JavaScript file from a third-party website that appears to contain a credit card stealer, as seen by Bleeping Computer. The vaping website pulls in JavaScript to skim credit cards. The malicious script is heavily obfuscated and exfiltrates payment data via Telegram to a hard-coded address present in the script. And this isn't the first time that Element Vape has been compromised either. 
In 2018, Element Vape customers reported receiving letters from the company stating a data breach had occurred and the window of intrusion was between December 6th of 2017 and June 27th of 2018. Since most of you are not information security nerds like myself, let me simply give you this little warning. Harm reduction requires that if you placed an order from Element Vape between February 5th and today, it's time for you to contact your bank and get a new card on its way. Don't wait until these hackers try to empty your bank account. Minimize harm and replace the card now. Oh, and since this is a malicious JavaScript file that is still active on their website, I'd hold off on purchasing anything from them until they fix it and let the public know about it. On February 15th, Dr. Robert Califf was confirmed as FDA commissioner with 50 voting yes, 46 voting no, and one senator voting present. With this confirmation came an onslaught of hypocrisy from every industry regulated by the FDA. Meatpoultry.com states, two issues facing the FDA are the labeling of plant-based milk alternatives and the possibility of legally using CBD in foods and beverages. The FDA currently does not allow CBD, which is a hemp extract, in foods, beverages, or dietary supplements because it is used by an FDA-approved drug. The milk industry has argued that milk alternatives such as almond milk and soy milk should not be labeled as milk. When SiteGroceryBusiness.com reports, as a cardiologist, Dr. Califf has a keen understanding of the impact of diet on human health. We hope that as an FDA continues to refine their regulatory positions, FDA experts not only recognize dairy's crucial role in a healthy diet beginning at a very young age, but also allow research showing the benefits of dairy fat to be considered in federal nutritional guidance. No other type of food or beverage provides the range and density of nutrients that dairy contributes to the American diet. Reactions from government leaders. Representative Rajna Krishna Morphy, chairman of the Subcommittee on Economic and Consumer Policy, issued the following excerpted statement after the Senate confirmed Califf as the new commissioner of the FDA. I wish to congratulate Dr. Califf on his confirmation as FDA commissioner. As chairman of the Subcommittee on Economic and Consumer Policy, I have prioritized the health and safety of all Americans. And it is my sincere hope that Dr. Califf shares this commitment to protect future generations as commissioner. In this new capacity, his role will be more important than ever to ensure that the FDA sets forth critical policies on a wide array of health issues, including addressing youth e-cigarette use and addiction, and lead and other toxic heavy metals in baby food. As we uncovered in our committee's investigation into the baby food industry, some baby food manufacturers are turning a blind eye to the amounts of toxic heavy metals in their baby foods that families are providing to their infants. Congressman Christopher Morphy rambles on and on about arsenic levels and toxic heavy metals in baby food and lead standards that are not going to be finalized by the FDA until April of 2024. Yet he looks forward to working with Dr. Califf to ensure that the FDA is successful in its mission to protect the health and safety of all Americans and especially our nation's children. Meanwhile, advisory.com reports, some experts and lawmakers expressed concerns about Caliph's ties to the pharmaceutical industry. Caliph has a long history of extensive financial ties to Big Pharma, most significantly through pharmaceutical industry funding of the Duke Clinical Research Institute. Michael Carome, director of Public Citizens Health Research Group said, we need someone to tilt in the opposite direction and be more pro-public health and less pro-regulated industry. 
Similarly, Dr. Maggie Hassan expressed concerns about Caliph's ties to the pharmaceutical industry. Given the opioid epidemic, Hassan said FDA needs a commissioner that, and I quote, acts independently from the pharmaceutical industry, makes decisions that are based on science, and puts the health and safety of Americans first. Isn't it just interesting how the industry-leading lobbyists and all the politicians that they're schmoozing all the time are all touting about how productive their relationship is going to be, while consumer groups and even some politicians have grave reservations about the big pharmacy ties of Mr. Califf, like Senator Richard Blumenthal from Connecticut, or Senator Maggie Hassan of New Hampshire, as they express concerns about Caliph's ties to the pharmaceutical industry. You know, the hypocrisy is blatantly obvious with some of these organizations and some of these people. So for those of us promoting vaping for tobacco harm reduction, let me just remind you, the Association for American Medical Colleges published Dr. Caliph's 2019 calls for an immediate ban on flavors in vaping products. Vigorous campaigns to correct misinformation about vaping and a concerted effort to prosecute those who sell vaping products to minors. This is all part of his regulatory trifecta, which starts off with lowering nicotine to sub-addictive levels. Number two, ban over-the-counter vaping products, which leads us directly to number three, which is he supports prescription vaping to allow short-term vaping use for complete smoking cessation. If you go and you read the entire posting, there's a link in the description below. Dr. Califf admits that prohibition will never work. So the only real solution involves a prescription if you want to vape. Does a prescription model for fentanyl work for cancer patients who are now limited on the pain medicine that they can receive because fentanyl has been abused by people selling black market drugs? It has nothing to do with cancer or the prescription model. Has prohibition ever worked? Or does it just artificially raise the rewards for those selling illegal products? Does elimination of over-the-counter availability help society? Or does it just cause more harm than doing nothing? Whether you realize it or not, the vaping industry is suffering from over-regulation, which already blocks adults' access to a safer product. Over 6 million products from over 300 companies applied for market authorization from the FDA, and only one product, a big tobacco company product, has been granted a marketing order. Is this harm reduction, or is this the FDA's actions which just keep increasing harms? Anyway. White House officials speaking on national drug control policy and addiction at MUSC. The Medical University of South Carolina will host symposium with Dr. Raul Gupta, the director of White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Gupta will give a symposium on drug policy and addiction on February 23rd at 9 a.m. The speech is part of a call to action to address what officials have referred to as an opioid overdose epidemic. When we focus on COVID, the opioid crisis is getting worse. As the COVID-19 pandemic threatened over the last two years to become the beast that ate the healthcare system, other health concerns, elective surgeries, diagnostic testing, were all backburnered. Then, as the heavy equipment sieges at various locations around Canada consumed political attention, and dominated the news cycle, other urgent health and social issues inevitably received scant notice. 
but they didn't go away. They continue exacting their lethal toll. And those on the front lines continue to raise alarms and call for help. The drug poisoning crisis is not getting better. Sean Hopkins, manager of a supervised consumption site run by the city of Toronto, told Yusuf, we're continuing to see records being set in terms of paramedic calls, deaths, and overdose numbers. A study released last month suggested that half of those who died from opioids in 2020 sought health care in the month before. Missed opportunities to provide help during the first wave of COVID-19. According to the Ontario Drug Policy Research Network at Toronto St. Michael's Hospital, a quarter of those who died had seen a doctor, gone to emergency ward, or been discharged from hospital in the week before dying. Experts said that while the prevailing assumption is that those using drugs are disconnected from the healthcare system, it was starting to learn how many had, in fact, been in contact with a healthcare facility or a healthcare provider in the days or even hours before fatal overdoses. And the stakes keep rising. A star investigation last year found that Toronto's supply of drugs was growing stronger and more toxic, with additives that make it harder to bring back those who overdose. Ladies and gentlemen, the consequences of drug wars are not limited to Toronto or New York or London. They are devastating society on a global scale. Campbell River Mirror clearly brings into focus the human toll of this toxic drug crisis. 26 toxic drug deaths, 26 parents, 26 cousins, 26 co-workers, 26 friends. Though 26 people died in Campbell River due to the toxic drug supply in the area, the effects extend much further into the community. Earlier this month, the BC Coroner Service released its annual report on the amount of deaths attributed to the toxic drug crisis in BC. In the greater Campbell area, 26 people lost their lives in 2021 due to drug toxicity at a rate that was drastically higher than in previous years. However, putting those numbers in the context of real people and their impact on the community, is it a bit harder than just looking at numbers on a page? Gwen Donaldson, coordinator for the Campbell River Community Action Team, said that any time we get one of these reports, it is incredibly disturbing and we feel so bad for the human loss. That's 26 people that were children once, 26 people that have kids of their own, have parents, have families, have friends, social networks, coworkers. The ripple effect of 26 people who are no longer in our community is quite dramatic, she said. It's really hard to contextualize. So with the spotlight focused on 26 deaths, where each personally was connected with hundreds, if not thousands of other people who felt that loss of one life. It's no wonder people can't relate to 8 million deaths per year. If 26 toxic supply deaths are too hard to conceptualize, then how can I expect anyone to conceptualize one death every five seconds? And more importantly, how do we get people to demand the changes required to prevent all of these unnecessary deaths? But it gets worse. The drugs are so toxic, she said. People are not overdosing. They're being poisoned by the supply. It's just incredibly contaminated. For people who work with drug users, it is too obvious how deep the crisis goes. However, for people who are not exposed to the drug crisis, it can be hard to see the reality of the situation. The stigmatism of substance use 
and people who use substances definitely leads to a public response where people don't expect that. Donaldson said, the fact of the matter is that the drug supply right now is incredibly toxic and poisonous. It will affect our community on a whole and not just one population or another. Black market suppliers and black market sources don't care about age verification. They don't care about 100% product safety. They only care about one thing, increasing their profits by increasing the potency of their products. Spike in drugs containing fentanyl on Cincinnati streets. Social media posts warning of a batch of street drugs spiked with potentially deadly fentanyl in Cincinnati are no hoax. One of the top agents with Cincinnati's Drug Enforcement Agency said there is an ongoing threat of traffickers mixing fentanyl into other illicit substances. It is extremely common, said Jason Schumacher, DEA, Cincinnati's assistant special agent in charge. Traffickers, mostly working directly with Mexican cartels, sell pills and street drugs with untold amounts of fentanyl in it. Most of the cocaine that we seize today has traces of fentanyl in it, Shoemaker said. It's not only cocaine, but methamphetamine and heroin. You know, last week we talked about fentanyl-laced vape pens. And this week, Mallory Gates even tagged me in a post where Evil Fathwell said, I'm 100% on the side of vaping. I make a living of it, making coils and juice, but you're lying. I make a THC vape juice out of PG and VG, so no clue what you're talking about as far as fentanyl. The fact you can eat it, sniff it, or smoke it, I don't see why you can't vape it. I'm sorry, Mallory, I couldn't get back to you on this one because how do you reply to stupid? Mallory was 100% right. All vaping e-juices are water-based, and THC oil will not fall into solution with VG and PG. It requires an emulsifier or ultrasonic breakdown of the oil. And in my opinion, shouldn't be vape because your lungs cannot metabolize oil. So it will slowly build up in your lungs. When a human lung breaks down oil, it creates lipids. And it's the reason lipoid pneumonia is behind the Evoli cases. Vitamin E acetate was identified in most of the cases. But when profiteering people with no understanding of fundamental science do things to get high and make money, who knows what substances they're going to use to infuse oil into water. Mark Twain said, Never argue with stupid people. They will drag you down to their level and then beat you with experience. For those of us fighting for harm reduction, all we can do is provide the facts that we know to be true. And it's up to the other person to learn what they need to know. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink if they don't want to. And technically, you can add anything to e-liquid. But that's not harm reduction. That is poisoning the well and creating a toxic supply that is now quickly taking over the black market. An evil fathwell may be 100% on the side of vaping, but clearly has no clue of how and why it works. Moving on. Over 300 dead in another record year for overdose deaths as city leaders grapple with solutions. Following another year of skyrocketing overdose deaths, Baton Rouge City and community leaders are doubling down on efforts to prosecute high-trafficking drug dealers and ease treatment access for people struggling with addiction. There are a lot of bodies that are washing up on shore said Tanya Miles, a substance abuse, abuse counselor and local advocate. We need to go where they're jumping in to stop them from getting to that point. Clark 
as the coroner has watched in real time as the opioid epidemic has tightened its grip on the parish. First, as people begin to turn to heroin when their prescription pain pills ran out, and then as the potent synthetic opioid fentanyl crept onto the scene. People that normally aren't opioid users, like they've used cocaine and methamphetamine and even recreational marijuana, are now getting those drugs laced with illicit fentanyl and have died from fentanyl, Clark said. Others, such as Jan Zlein, Laughing House, Executive Director for Capital Area Human Services, emphasized ongoing efforts to treat addiction using research-proven methods and partnerships amid the epidemic. The coronavirus pandemic merely exacerbated the overdose deaths already trending upward prior to 2020, she said. We were in dire straits before, and now we are dealing with the wreckage, she said. People who didn't have a problem before have them now. People who had problems before now have them exponentially worse. As Laughing House and others have repeatedly emphasized, substance abuse is a brain disease that can only be cured through treatment. Medically assisted treatment involves using less addictive drugs, such as Suboxone or Methadone to wean people off opioids, combined with counseling and behavioral therapies. Additionally, the court works to educate loved ones on the signs of substance misuse so they can prevent relapses or overdoses. And just locking them up, Wyatt said, that's not working anymore. Did it ever really work? Seriously? Is there anybody that truly believes that that works? Locking them up? Throwing away the key? Does that stop the problem from being there? Anyway... When people using drugs are not necessarily ready to begin treatment, some advocate for harm reduction instead. Jar Payne, executive director of the Capital Area Reentry Program, works to get people clean syringes, wound care kits, and Narcan, the life-saving drug that reverses opioid overdoses. Toward the end of Thursday's meeting, Chief Paul reminded attendees that there is a great deal of trauma in Baton Rouge community, and that this fuels addiction. John Daly, who works for the district attorney's office, added that marijuana and alcohol are not what tend to lead to dangerous substance use. More often than not, it's trauma. That is the true gateway drug. You know, folks, we talked about this before, true. Trauma, molestation, and neglect are the gateways to seek substance use and abuse. Just like how crack pipes aren't the problem. Stigmatizing harm reduction is. I spent most of my days in back alleys, under highways and in empty lots, looking for people that need my support. I am a harm reduction outreach worker. And every day, me and my team distributed sterile syringes, naloxone, hygiene kits, and yes, crack pipes to people who use drugs in New York City. We do this because we want to help keep people healthy, safe, and most importantly, alive. Most people know that sharing syringes can cause disease transmission, but that risk is present when pipes are shared too. When people smoke from glass pipes, they sometimes burn or cut their lips, allowing hepatitis C or HIV transmission to occur. By providing people with sterile supplies, they do not have to take that risk. I know that safer use supplies keep people safe. That's why I was so disgusted to see misdirected outrage in response to the federal government finally providing funding to harm reduction programs. Despite the misleading headlines, our communities aren't facing a problem around the distribution of so-called crack pipes, or as we call them, stems or straights. The real problem is the historical lack of investment in public health solutions that connect people to support and care. And it's no coincidence that funding of crack pipes is what's fueling all this debate. 
That rhetoric is a dog whistle to the anti-black Reagan era politics that led us to the record number of overdose deaths we see today. Sorry, folks, but for those of you who forget history, you're doomed to repeat it. And we all remember Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign. But do you know about Reagan's kid's drug nightmare? Ronald Reagan's wild child daughter says she was a coke-snorting, pill-popping druggie who nearly slit her wrists in a narcotics-fueled suicide bid. And Patty Davis says every time she sees a mugshot of actor Robert Downey Jr., who reminds her of her days as an out-of-control teen drug user. I can almost taste it in the back of my throat, and I love the taste. You don't get over drugs. Davis, now 48, writes in this week's Time magazine. Every time I see a movie in which people are doing coke, I want it. Davis says she fell deeply in love with drugs at the age of 15, gobbling methadrine and dexedrine and snorting cocaine. Their narcotics took her far away. They let you hide, which is what frightened people want to do. You will never understand drug addiction unless you understand that it's a love story, she says. Anyway, just say no in anti-black Reagan era politics are history that we never want to repeat. It's just plain wrong. Just like stigmatizing harm reduction we cannot continue to stigmatize harm reduction. Not only do people get less help, it also makes politicians skittish and cause much needed life-saving resources to dry up. We can already see it happening in the short time between the Department of Health and Human Services announcement of $30 million dedicated to harm reduction strategies and the outrage that ensued the federal government has now removed smoking pipes from the list of public health tools getting funded. This is a knee-jerk reaction and one that misses the point of harm reduction completely. When I was homeless and using drugs in the street, it was a harm reduction worker that inspired me to turn my life around. I saw outreach workers every week to get safer use supplies. And after building a trusting relationship, I accepted an invitation to get out of the cold. Soon, I was a regular at the drop-in space and eventually enrolled in a job training program. Today, I have a full-time job as an outreach worker, my own apartment, and a life I am proud of. None of that would have been possible without the first interaction where I was offered safe use supplies. This is the real value of harm reduction. But if my story isn't proof enough, the research speaks for itself. According to the Center for Disease Control, AKA the CDC, harm reduction programs like the one I work for are safe, effective, and play a vital role in reducing HIV and hepatitis C transmission. Research shows that new users of harm reduction programs are five times more likely to enter drug treatment and about three times more likely to stop using drugs than those who don't use programs. As the United States grapples with the worst overdose crisis it's ever seen, with over 100,000 people lost to preventable overdose in just one year, the black and Latino rates of overdose surging, we must stop with moralizing and racist information. To scapegoat public health tools as the problem is the opposite of what's needed right now. The federal government must not cave to this false narrative and instead do everything it can to expand resources to support life-saving proven harm reduction programs across the country. We are running out of time. Lives depend on it. Jerry Foster is a harm reduction outreach worker at Vocal NY. You know, folks, the parallels that can be drawn between this harm reduction story and the story of any mom and pop vape shop 
are undeniable. One day someone turns you on to vaping and tells you that vaping, with vaping, you can enjoy all the parts of smoking that you enjoy, but you're not going to get most of the, if not any, harms from doing it. So you go and you give it a go. You go buy a vape and you try different flavors to see which one works the best. And before you know it, you haven't touched a cigarette in days. For some, you have to really commit to not smoking and force yourself to only vape. But for others who get lucky and find the right flavor the first time out, there really isn't any force needed. You just simply reach for the more enjoyable product. This is what harm reduction is all about, folks and why the first step is going to be to decriminalize all of it across the country and around the world. The only way to guarantee a safe supply is to legalize all of it. If you wanna see unnecessary deaths be a thing of the past, people who seek drugs must be able to readily purchase a safe, regulated supply of them. For alcohol, all we expect is age verification. So why isn't that standard adopted for everything? And why hasn't the FDA authorized e-liquid and vaping products for sale in adult-only stores? You can't ignore one death every five seconds. Can you? Well, technically in the US, it's one death every minute because of cigarette combustion. Overdose deaths are one person every five minutes. And for every overdose death, there are five deaths from tobacco combustion. Regardless, all of these deaths could benefit from harm reduction. So why aren't we doing more about it? Fentanyl test strips bill faces uphill fight in Missouri General Assembly. Why do test strips have such an uphill fight? Do we have such apathy and disdain for people who use drugs? They're not even allowed to see if their next fix could kill them? Meanwhile, in British Columbia, Canada, Alberta should launch Safe Drug Supply Pilot Program Committee here. I know I'm running long, folks, but let me just wrap this thing up with a quote from Edmonton Police Chief Dale McPhee, who's representing the Alberta Association of Chiefs of Police. McPhee said the AACP is looking for a balanced approach and that there cannot be policy changes without treatment options. Let us put the health and safety of our vulnerable citizens first by developing a comprehensive approach on the ways we can tackle this on both ends of the supply and demand. If safe supplies are cheaper and more readily available than tainted black market products, doesn't the demand for black market products go away? If safe supplies are obtained from trained addiction specialists, doesn't demand reduce as more people get treatment for their addiction? Isn't it time to end the hypocrisy and fully adopt harm reduction for everything? All it takes is a little bit of science and compassion to stop preventable deaths. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy and News for the week ending February 19th, 2021. I sincerely want to thank all of you for sticking around and allowing me to take a deep dive into harm reduction. It's all about saving lives and the reason that we vape instead of smoke. For those of you who miss the vaping science and news, don't worry. I'll be putting out another episode later this week with everything that happened, like how the Swiss are banning tobacco ads or What's the progress on the Philippines vape bill? Or 
the urgency for a new approach to tobacco control in Kenya, and even the Irish Vaping Association saying, fruit flavors are for adults. All this and more coming up on the next episode. So until then, be good to each other and keep on vaping.